Okay, I'd like to call the uh, Joint Special School Building Committee to order. It's Thursday, May 22nd, 2019. We're at the Nashua High School North Lecture Hall, and it is 7.01 p.m. 23rd, what did I say? 20. Put the right glasses on. Here we go. 23rd. Okay. Um, I was wondering where you get it. <laughs> Uh, so, Mr. Garino will, will lead us in the prayer, and uh, Foldham and Jetty would lead us in the pledge. Broken. Please stand. Almighty God, we have the high honor and the serious duty to manage the educational affairs of our beloved city. Fill us, O oh God, with the spirit of unity and understanding, which enables us to face our multiple problems with serene, a serene mind, with justice and charity for all so that any and all decisions made by us will always be for the betterment and greater happiness of all of our fellow citizens. So help us God, amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Okay. Would the uh, clerk please call the roll? Okay. Uh, Alderman Dowd? Present. Ald Alderwoman Wilshire? Here. Alderwoman Melissa Goya? Alderman Jetty? Here. Alderman Alderwoman Clee? Ms. Oden? Here. Mr. Garino is here. Ms. Raymond? Here. Mr. Mosher is Mr. Mosher? Here. Yep, you're here. Ms. Porter? Here. Mr. Mosher is joining us by telephone. Are you by yourself tonight, Mr. Mosher? I certainly am. Okay. Also uh, joining us is uh, Ms. Fitzpatrick. And uh, we also have gentlemen. Maybe you can introduce yourself. Oh. Down on the end, uh, from Harriman is Dan Bison. Mm -hmm. From Harriman, Mark Lee. And also from Harriman, Jamie Willett. Okay. And we have Mr. Smith with us also. And... Carl Dubois, Harvey Construction. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Alderman Melissa Goya will be here late, and uh, Alderman Clee had a prior engagement, so won't be here this evening. Okay, uh, previous meeting minutes approval. If there are no objections, I will accept the minutes of the meeting of April 18th, 2019, waive the reading and place them on file. Remarks by school administration, Mr. Smith. Uh, nothing tonight. Other than you can do the other stuff later. I'll do the other stuff later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ms. Fitzpatrick. I may make some comments after the architect's report. Okay. Can I just point out that I'm not on the last meeting minutes? Uh huh. Okay. <coughs> we will fix that. I blame the clerk. <laughs> <laughs> if he only saw you every once in a while. Um, all right, so remarks by the chairman. Um, the only thing that concerned me this evening is um, if we can get a heads up when we're going to have a conflict like a, something going on in the auditorium with seating, I mean with parking, um, you know, we could move this meeting to City Hall or push comes to shove to Nashville High South is, is, you know, not much parking out there. Yes? Nashua High South does have a conflict that night, which is why it's not there. And then No, I meant tonight. Oh, excuse me, sorry. So any time that we're going to have scheduled one of these meetings, and I also sort of happened at the, at the city's budget review, although no one from the public showed up, but had they had a crowd of people come to, to testify, uh, I don't know what was going on, but there wasn't any parking. So uh, maybe if we could just get a copy uh, of the, uh, or if I could get a copy of the, the schedule for the use of the high schools, you know, we could work around it. Okay, 
Items for discussion, the architect's report. Hi, this is Jamie Willett with Harriman again. So uh, we're back here again, and we've got uh, some more information to share. Uh, got a new report up there. I put a new cover page, so you all knew it was different. I know last time it was the same page, and I heard a question out there like, is this the same one as last time? <laughs> <laughs> the date was a key. That's right. That's right. So uh, tonight's agenda on the architect's report, we're going to talk about the facility assessment overview. Um, that'll hit uh, some of the items we saw uh, while we did our reviews of the building um, and show you some imagery and, and kind of discuss some of those items. We have a scheduled flow chart, which will outline the uh, process where we're at, how we're going, and, and where it's going to end up. Um, and then we're going to show, uh, we'll talk about a little bit about the programming and concept design update. Uh, the floor plan, floor plan precedent diagrams are in there and some best practices imagery. Uh, show you what, uh, what you might, might be able to expect in a, in a school. Um, and then we'll, at the end, we'll hit the uh, schedule and milestones, kind of uh, where we're at and where we're going. <clears throat> so we walked around the schools and uh, uh, the sites of the schools, there was some pretty evident uh, traffic and uh, bus parent drop-off issues. Um, I have a point drawn here, let me see if I can find that. This one up here is uh, Elm Street, and um, my understanding is they, the parents drop off on the street, and the students come into the school, and the bus loop comes through here. Um, and uh, it, you know, with the street being there, it can be, you know, it can be dangerous where people are backing out of those parking spaces and, and whatnot, and parking is also uh, another issue at Elm Street. Uh, Penichuk, uh, we've heard some issues about uh, the parent, well, A, there's no emergency access out of the site, um, and also the parent drop-off tends to block some parking through here and cause a little bit of congestion. Uh, fairgrounds, they drop off again at the street, which is a little, quite a bit of distance from that school, and the bus loop, and they, I guess they come up through this little loop here where the buses are also parked, so it's kind of a conflict between the two slightly. Uh, and then we have some um, issues at, at uh, Elm Street where there's some haunched uh, walkways and, and the play field is, I think, it's not really a play field, but it kind of is a play field. We saw some students out there the other day uh, kind of playing in this little tiny area here. It's off to the side of the modulars. The modulars are right here, and the street's right over here, so... It was a little bit of play area, but it wasn't, it wasn't quite the, uh, probably quite the need for some of these students. And we also did see some kids reading at the front of the school out here uh, during a class time. <clears throat> uh, the building envelope, um, the windows and doors are around pretty much all three schools. Elm, Elm Street has some, some newer windows. Uh, we, there were some reported that were uh, older and, and, and hard to operate. There's some uh, operational issues on them, but... Um, the, the windows even at Penetrack, which is the newest of the schools, is, is, is kind of beyond its expected life expectancy. You know, 25, 30 years is, is uh, pushing it there. So, and actually this photo here is Penetrack, and you can see the seals are kind of beaten up a little bit. And, and, and uh, window screens were an often missing item on some of the windows. Doors had rust through and frames and stuff like that. So, you know, those, those will... Uh, just continue to rust as they, as they hit the weather and the salts. Uh, insulation in the buildings, um, fairgrounds and Elm Street in the 30s and I believe the 60s wing uh, actually have no insulation in the exterior wall, or at least not reported in the uh, existing drawings that we have. Um, it's basically a block, a little bit of an airspace, and then brick. So um, our value of that is usually around five, three to five, something like that. And a new school would have a 25, 30, I mean, maybe not 30, but probably 25. 20. <clears throat> so, uh, so that's quite a, bit of, quite a big difference. Um, <clears throat> brick and mortar, you can see this is just a snapshot of some of the, the, um, br the mortar that we saw failing at a window. It, it, just, it just needs to be, you know, some of the brick needs to be repointed down, maybe not this spe specific example, but uh, overall... You can see some defailing brick sills here. So what happens, the water comes in and keeps, it freezes and it keeps blowing that out over time and, and uh, freeze-thaw process. Cool. We'll eat that up a little bit. 
And then roofs, uh, a lot of the roofs are, uh, have been replaced, but there are some areas that have older roofs and, and are due, due for uh, some, some replacement. <clears throat> Uh, ADA, uh, you know, handicap accessibility. Um, mo mostly, I would say that the two of the schools that uh, ha had the, uh, the biggest ADA accessibility issues were Elm Street and uh, Fairgrounds. Those are both built after the time of standards starting to fall in. Uh, Penichuk is in the 80s, and, and it w although it wasn't uh, federally uh, made law at the time, they, they still were starting to create some some of the uh, requirements that were, were needed. And so that some of them are passable and you might find some in Penichuk that, that aren't quite there, but uh, you, look th you look at things like restrooms. <clears throat> you can see here, this is a, it looks like a stall that it's accessible, but that door doesn't open all the way. Um, so you, you really may not get a wheelchair in there after all. Uh, things like this is if the urinal's right up against the screen, somebody that's, uh, oops, oh, there we go, I already passed it, there we go. Uh, you know, a wheelchair may not be able to get in there and use that stall, or, or just, you know, so not, not just a wheelchair, but, you know, it could be difficult for anybody. <clears throat> mm. um, stairs and handrails, uh, handrails are required to be like a rounded uh, um, handrail and have extensions on them, and this one comes up and stops right at the top of the step. Um, that's not even to mention that the, the guardrails themselves have holes that are bit too big. It's not really an accessibility issue, but more of a code issue. So, um, you know, they, they need to be certain space and certain heights. Um, and a lot of the stairs are found not to, not to fall into that in Elm Street. Uh, and then casework, uh, here's an example of, uh, I, I like this picture. It, didn't, it did more justice than just the ADA accessibility. It's, it's showing kind of the condition of the casework in general. Uh, this is a science lab at... Street. That was Elm Street, <clears throat> and uh, you know there's no there's no place for a person to come up in a wheelchair, and and, and this is just one exi one spot, but there was none in the science wing. Um, a, a, a handicap accessible person could get up there and um, use that sink. So <clears throat> structural, uh, the, the primary finding of, of structural deficiencies was at Elm Street, so that I kind of put that as our highlight on this one. Um, in uh, both fairgrounds, uh, maybe Penichuk and um, Elm Street, drift considerations, you know, weren't a re real requirement at the time. So when they, they didn't account for drifting snow, they just accounted for a, a basically a vertical snow load. And uh, so that, that's one thing that needs to be considered when you when you when you when you're looking at the structural integrity of the building. The slab in the 30s uh, wing is uh, suspect. We, we were actually there tonight looking at that. Uh, it, a lot of, um, we're not quite sure what's going on. We're gonna do a little more investigation, but a lot of cracking down the hallways and, and the floor seems to be very unlevel in areas and, and uh, patchy. Is that all you yeah, it, describe it as? It's, uh, so uh, it shows evidence, evidence of deterioration. There have been areas in the building that have had the floor repaired. Uh, and so we're just trying to understand what's going on with the uh, original concrete slab, floor slab. Um, also, we have structural concrete failures. You can see here, there's, uh, this is outside near the cafeteria and the gymnasium and the kind of, say they call the back of the building. Uh, there's a concrete, these concrete structures. Uh, some of this goes onto the roof of the cafeteria area, but you can see there's clear spalling of concrete here. In some areas, it's actually left the rebar exposed. Um, and when that rebar starts to rust, you, you lose the integrity of the, of the actual concrete uh, structure itself. Uh, and then here's also a windowsill. Uh, should be attached back to the wall, but there's a clear pushing out of that actual sill. These are both at Elm Street. Uh, you know, pushing off the wall. Um, so it's something that should be looked at to be reattached and, or, or you, know, push, you know, push back into place or even more investigation of what's actually happening there. <clears throat> uh, mechanical and plumbing systems. Uh, the systems, uh, basically the plumbing systems are, are mostly outdated. Um, I, I put it just outdated plumbing equipment. It's not every single piece of equipment's outdated, but the mass of them seem to be. Uh, low flow plumbing fixtures. There are low flow fixtures in the building, 
Um, most of them, mo again, most didn't quite meet the newest standard, which is even low, we call it lower flow. Um, the controls are outdated in all three buildings. Uh, the mechanical equipment is past its useful life. There, there are some newer burners and air handlers and things like that, so it's not an end all be all that everything's gone bad. But you can see, like, here's that one on Penachuk here of the roof. It's just an older unit. It's probably original to the building and uh, it's ready to be replaced. They're just past their useful life. And now, that's not to say they're not running and operating. Some may not be very, very well. Um, but in that, you lose, you know, they become inefficient. Uh, they're running harder, they're you know, burning up more electricity, and, and uh, it's just they're just ready to be replaced. You can see there's, there's real rusted equipment here, it's been there for a while. These sinks are, you know, they have hot and cold, so you know, it's, you know, it's a scalding type scenario where you could burn yourself if the water's too hot. And you can't read this tag here, but it put that uh, backflow, backflow valve out of, out, of, um, out of service at the time, when we were there, you know, it could be. Could have been replaced since if, if I could just interject, the Penachuk has got a major thing going on now with backflows, and they won't approve any flow of water without a backflow. I think it's a fairly new thing for them, but uh, they're doing it across the whole city. <coughs> we look at electrical. Um, the services at the at least two of the buildings are near capacity. It's uh, Fairgrounds and Penachuk. What does that mean? Well, that means if we put, if we have to put an addition or, or add, um, you know, more outlets and stuff like that, you're, you're going to be put, you're going to be, or, or new mechanical equipment, maybe uh, be more efficient so that you'd have to look at it, but certainly addition, you'd be taxing that service and you'd probably look at, oop, oh, I do that every time. You're going to look, end up at replacing that. Um, the panels, you can see here, this is, I believe, Elm Street. It's, it's uh, an older panel. This one here, it's a little hard to see here. Some of the pictures you look up close, you might be able to see them, but it's definitely an older panel. Um, that doesn't mean it doesn't work. It just means that, you know, if you have to replace circuit breakers, you end up, you may end up having to replace the panel, or, or maybe sometimes I've heard people go on eBay and look for parts for stuff, and it just, it's, it's, uh, it just, it's past, past its useful life. This one here is uh, of particular interest because it's actually in a stairway. Uh, where students can get, and that was the case at Elm Street. There was some down the hallways and stuff like that. You just, you know, students have access to them. Now, you can lock them sometimes, but um, kids are crafty, and they can, they'll find their way into them, potentially, so. Um, the building lacked lighting controls, automatic lighting controls. Um, that doesn't mean there's nothing in the buildings. Uh, in fact, there were some at Elm Street that I was there today, um, but overall, um, it lacked uh, light, automatic lighting controls, which is a requirement, um, modern day um, energy uh, code requirements. The uh, fire alarm system, uh, it, they're all functional fire alarm systems as far as we could see, but modern code again has brought uh, voice evac, as an NFPA has required voice evac in the entire building. Um, so does that mean you have to update not necessarily, it depends on what the locals are going to require. If you do how much you tell the building you touch, um, that may trigger that the whole fire alarm system has to be brought up to code. So it's, it's uh, one of those things you just discover as you get, not when you get there, but you got to investigate a little bit how much of the building you're touching, talk with the local fire marshal and, and whatnot and see what, they, what they're going to require. And then the PA systems are... Uh, are antiquated. Uh, I know the one at Penachuk, for example, has a has an air raid button right on it. I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, well, I think it's not something we necessarily worry about right now. Um, so, but yeah, I, I like this picture here. <laughs> you know, it had a speaker with a homemade box. So that's kind of neat. Oh, this is interesting too. These fixtures are these uh, light, are light switches, and uh, I personally had never seen them before. But you know, some people might have. But these are at uh, fair, uh, fairgrounds. So here's another older panel here. <clears throat> Security and safety. Um, the buildings did have some access controls at doors, um, but it wasn't uh, universal. Uh, you know, I can't remember which school it was off the top of my head, but one of the schools, uh, we didn't even note uh, the doors being monitored so that, you know, they were missing the, the device that monitors them. Um, site lighting I put up here because uh, it was... You know, like it, here's Elm Street, and there was no lights along this back entry. There may have been a pole somewhere around, but 
you know, not in this picture. So, you know, we've, we found the site lighting overall to be um, less than adequate. Um, a lot of hidden, hidden corners and stuff. Uh, and egress lighting was also something we found um, in a couple of the schools to be uh, not quite uh, up to par. Uh, and then uh, I think the big one out, out of the safety and security that we noted was uh, Fairgrounds Middle School and, and uh, Elm Street Middle School. The security, there's no security vestibule. In fact, you know, right here where that door is is where you come into the building and you have to come all the way down the whole corridor. You get buzzed in at the door and they can see you on a little camera. But as soon as somebody gets into that building, there's no, you know, there's, there's yeah, they have to be trusted that they're going to come all the way down to the office to be checked in. And then the same thing with, with uh, Elm Street. You come in that main entry after being buzzed in and you have to go up the stairs and down the hall to get to the, uh, the office. <clears throat> so nobody's kind of monitoring those once you get into the doors. So now we get to the schedule flow chart that I referred to earlier in the agenda. <clears throat> this kind of shows, I mean, you've seen, you've seen iterations of this. Uh, I thought this would be helpful to kind of see A, where we're at, and uh, B, kind of, kind of how, this is, how this is working out right now. So we talked about the facility analysis, and so here's some things that we've done. Um, you know, the existing conditions findings, which we're reporting to you tonight and showing you the conditions of some things. Uh, survey studies and reports um, are in progress. Uh, you know, that kind of includes these things too. So a HERA, we've seen in a HERA report. Um, we've also brought, we also have a, um, uh, a blank here, a, uh, yeah, we're looking at getting an impact survey for uh, hazardous materials being done. Um, the site survey is in progress. So it's not checked here, but it's in progress. Um, I'm expecting something any time in the next couple of weeks from them, from the surveyor. Uh, traffic study, we're, we're working on. Uh, geotechnical exploration, that's being worked on right now. And again, I expect something in the next couple of weeks. Um, and then at the end of that facility analysis, so this is that facility analysis, there'll be recommendations based on our findings. And, and then the next kind of part of that is or separate, but part of that study phase, so to speak, is the educational programming. Uh, in that, you'll look at, we've looked at existing building. Uh, I'll kind of summarize this a little bit. We've, you have a space allocation worksheet, which is uh, we look and see what spaces are in the building, existing building, and, and map it out. And then you do the same thing for proposed. If you, you know, you're going to add students to one school or a new school, you kind of map that out. Uh, we've done a, sta a staff survey, uh, which is out right now. Um, I believe it closed today. It closed today. Yeah. Uh, and, and in the first uh, couple days, we actually had a lot of feedback. I mean, I think we had, I think Tuesday, we saw 170 uh, people had already responded, stu uh, staff had res responded to it. Um, so, and, that's, uh, and then there was a reminder sent out Tuesday night, I believe. And, um, and so we, I expect we've seen more. We haven't gone back to see the data yet for that second wave. Um, summary of interviews, we've met with administration, we've met with CTE, we've met with SPED. Uh, we're looking to meet with athletics and security. Um, we have seen a security report um, from the school, but we want to meet with the security team and, and talk about um, you know, maybe some deficiencies that may not have been the report or just suggestions for the future and protocol. We put together some bubble diagrams for both the um, existing and new. And, um, and uh, we're looking to put together a community forum. Some of you may or may not have heard that. I'm not sure where it's, uh, Donna will be able to speak on where it's maybe gonna be posted, but the date is uh, June 3rd, 6.30 at Elm Street. Um, so that'll be a community forum. We're gonna encourage community to come and talk about, um, talk about, huh? This talk about this project, so. I'm sorry, did you say 6.30? believe so. It's six o'clock. Okay, sorry. I just wanted to clarify because we are sending out a, a blast tomorrow. Okay. Stacy Hines, our communication director, is working with me on that, so I just want to make sure we're saying the correct time. Okay, I'm uh, sorry. it's not correct on this this today, Okay. so um, if six o'clock is the time, that's, that's fine. June 3rd, six o'clock in 3rd. the Elm Street uh, cafeteria. Thank you, Donna. <clears throat> So you take those two, they take the facility analysis and you take the educational programming, we call it analysis, 
combine those to come up with a concept design. You add those together, it comes up with a concept design that looks at both the sites and the buildings. So we're, we're moving into there right, well, we've kind of been doing a little bit uh, before right now, but uh, we're getting in there right now and really getting the heat of that moving up. Um, you know, we want to make sure we have all these little missing pieces to make sure that adds correctly. Um, so once we get there, um, we'll hand off these items in pieces to Harvey. Um, and they'll be able to start coming up with the cost of the project and pieces that we're looking at. Um, so that way we can review that and then we'll look at operating. Meanwhile, we're looking at operating costs for a, the existing and the proposed with either renovations or the new school. And, um, and then we'll also do an energy cost analysis. Again, same existing proposed renovation or new school and that'll have recommendations at the end of it. <clears throat> Any questions on that before we move to the next item? <coughs> Good. Uh, yeah. The analysis of the cost is going to be over a 15, 20 year period, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. we usually project it, act, act, sometimes we'll actually project it forward to 20 to 30 years. Uh, okay. And we look at not only the first cost, but we look at the financing cost and the operating cost over the, that period of time. Right. Okay. Yeah. Great. As, as uh, one of the items that, that Jamie was talking about is looking at the, uh, as we move from an evaluation of, of your existing programs, the <laughs> educational programs, uh, and, and we project forward to what the, uh, the project will encompass with either a renovated uh, school or a new school and uh, changes to some of the existing uh, buildings, uh, both fairgrounds and Panachok. Uh, but, but one of the things we start to do is we start to look at, at some precedent uh, diagrams of, of other middle schools and how they are organized. And so in, in the event that we look at or it's a, a new school, uh, we start considering what the diagram of, of the building is going to look like. One of the, the popular concepts we're seeing uh, is, a, is a courtyard uh, model. We'll share one courtyard school with you. Uh, and this is what we call a, a party diagram. It's architects invent lots of funny names for things. But, but so this, uh, the, the dashed lines indicate how you move through the building. They're the circulation routes. Uh, and, and the dots represent major points in the building itself. And so with this one, the primary entrance to the building is here, and there's a primary circulation zone that comes up, and it separates classroom, the classroom wing on this side of the building from the public area. Uh, and, and by public, we mean those uh, areas of the building, those functions of the building that are open to the public oftentimes after hours. And so the ability to close off the classroom components but leave the public components open or even during the day uh, when you do have a, a function that where the public is invited in, that they're not going through classroom areas to get to these publicly uh, used facilities. And so there's, there's a level of safety and security that's involved in that. And here's uh, a little more uh, flushed out in terms of the different types of spaces. And so, so these, this is the gymnasium and the athletic area in this building. This is the, um, there's the cafeteria and the kitchen, and then there's an auditorium and music spaces on this side. Uh, and then there's, here's the courtyard, which all this is arranged, arranged around. And then there's the, uh, as, as we've uh, looked at, the idea of locating the administration area directly adjacent to the primary main entrance, and so that there's a level of monitoring and safety as you move into the building. This one actually has a, an administrative presence in other areas of the classroom wings, and and uh, and that's um, part of the philosophy here, where they allow students to work in areas, breakout spaces, um, outside of the classroom, and um, and by having an administrative presence next to those breakout areas, uh, it allows allows students to to work there, but still be supervised. Uh, and then the the sort of circles, these orange circles, are the primary core academic classrooms. And the green are uh, either uh, unified art spaces or uh, exploration uh, labs, STEM STEM labs, uh, and um, and so uh, this is just the upper level, very very similar layout as to lower level. This one happened to have the library on the upper level here, but um, and so so this is what looking out from the commons of the cafeteria onto that courtyard uh, looks like, and 
And so it creates an outdoor space that actually is an enclosed, safe and secure space. And not, not unlike what actually we have at Elm Street. We have two courtyards that are enclosed at Elm Street. But this one, uh, as you look out, is, is, uh, has, has pathways and, and benches where students can gather and sit. And on nice days, you can actually eat out on, you can see a, there's a hardscaped area directly outside of the, of the cafeteria commons for that. And at all times during the day, you have, you have a strong sense of where you are relative to how uh, the sun is moving inside of that courtyard area. This is another uh, uh, shot of that same commons or cafeteria space. And this one has a, a community stair. So here's, on, on one side, it's a standard stair that goes from the first level up to the second level. And on the other side of it, it really becomes an assembly space that allows it to function not only for congregating, and, and, uh, but also uh, it can function for uh, a, a lecture hall or an assembly space. That, and directly opposite the seats, there's a projection screen. So you can actually host a large presentation in this area. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, again, right, right off of that same courtyard. We, we just happen to be standing about here looking out of that courtyard in that previous picture. Here you can look back to the main entrance uh, right here. And so it's really, as you come in, this very public open space. Uh, and up above, you can see it says Learning Commons. That's where the library is and lots of transparency uh, in an inviting way of uh, welcoming people into that. And at the lower level, there's actually a, the security vestibule is right through those doors. And that's the main office right there. So here you can see that diagram of the courtyard, the classrooms that go around the courtyard the gymnasium, the auditorium, and that primary street right there with the administration at the front. Another example is a middle school uh, that has a T-shaped uh, configuration where uh, it's broken apart uh, on the, instead of a courtyard, the uh, classrooms are organized along this primary spine here. And that primary spine is bisected with a community uh, called the community spine, that, that uh, major access where the main entrance is right here. And then the common spaces, the cafeteria, the gym uh, are on this side of, of it. And then there's actually an auditorium that's a little further with a shared high school in this particular one. But this middle school uh, has, has its teaming structure. And it's a two-story. And it has uh, six, six uh, teams, two per grade. Uh, and uh, about a 500 student middle school. And, uh, and so the organization of the classrooms in this one are in these areas. The common spaces are in the middle of those classrooms. And so in a similar model to the last one we looked at, supervision is actually uh, in that there are eyes always on the common space. Those light blue ovals are where students are allowed to go outside of the classroom and collaborate and work uh, and gather uh, and for projects in that area, and we'll see an example of those. And, and in this model, there are these uh, purple ovals where there are professional development spaces for staff. And so the, instead of the staff uh, uh, getting um, a, a def uh, assigned classroom in this model, the, the staff actually uh, share usage of classrooms, and, but they have a separate office space. And so uh, in, in this school, um, they collaborate uh, and work in professional development and, and curriculum development together in those areas. And they're still accessible to students. And so that was one of the important things we talked about uh, with these teachers is that, that to make sure that they felt that the students were able to access them and it wasn't simply an off-limits uh, uh, off zone for students. Uh, and, so, and so you can see there's a clustering of a team here, a team here, and a team here in this this model, and then you uh, move through here. This administration directly adjacent to the primary entrance. You move in uh, through this area. We have uh, fitness and athletics. We have um, the uh, uh, cafeteria on one side, and then there's performance space over here. In in this school, it was radical. They, they took a radical approach to the library in this, and in, in that they wanted the library to be dispersed throughout the entire building itself. And so they don't have a library. They actually have a circulation desk on the second floor in the hallway. And then they have these book stacks are distributed throughout all of the hallways. And so the idea that, that the whole library itself gets, gets dispersed and distributed across the entire building. And, um, and it's supposed to foster uh, the idea that um, that you uh, that, that literature and finding books isn't simply just a process of 
of looking it up in a card catalog or on, on an online database and going directly to get and retrieve the book, but that um, you can stumble on uh, literature or references in a way that's uh, exploratory and, and, um, and sort of uh, a, a, an aspect of curious uh, curiosity and learning in that way. So a little different than, than a standard library. Uh, this is that their common dining space and a similar model where they have a window wall out onto a courtyard. They have a community stair that uh, sits between uh, a regular stair that goes up and down. And at the top here is where that library circulation desk is uh, at that location. This is the common space uh, for the students to work outside of the classrooms. They didn't even call them classrooms. They called them learning studios. And, and this was the portal or opening to one learning studio where it has a very large door. You can see the width of the door is about 10 feet wide and it's a sliding door that just folds into, uh, <coughs> excuse me, into the wall itself. And, um, and so it really, it, and the intent is to try to break down this sense of there's an enclosed uh, classroom that's separate from the, the common space. It's really all one learning studio or learning environment. And then you can see there are some tables here that students work on. This student, when we were there, happened to actually be uh, working on the whiteboard. Um, and the whiteboard is outfitted with a short throw projector as well. A lot of the student work is exhibited all around this. Uh, and then there's a feature of natural light. This happens to be on the first floor level, uh, but the, there's an uh, organization of the building where um, they can organize vertically through, uh, through the floors or they can organize along one floor itself. Um, but this lets natural light in from the upper level and a skylight down into the, the central, central area where they, the students do work. Here's the same collaboration common team space from the different angle uh, where there's actually a room that's, that's termed the collaboration room. So it's a small group study room. It's available for, uh, for pull-out work, for small group work, for conference uh, and, and meetings. Uh, and that occurs right there. There's, you can see there's some uh, furniture that, that's uh, more uh, uh, f uh, flexible for pulling together and students can just kind of land on it. It can be a stool, it can be a seat, it can be a laptop stand. Um, and then, uh, I think that looks like about the same image we had before, but uh, a little better shot of it um, there. This is in the, in the very first uh, building that we were looking at with that courtyard model where the professional development offices occur behind here and then this is the landing zone for students to work and collaborate and it's uh, essentially just pulled off of the corridor itself. Uh, and it also has some of that same idea of the furniture. This has a little rocking stool that, that uh, um, students can sit on uh, and then it has just the, the low furniture with tables in the middle of it to work. Uh, as we look at other practices that we're seeing in middle school design, this is a uh, STEM lab, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And so it's, it, we sometimes look at it as kind of a cross between an uh, art room and a science lab. And you can see that we have, we have lots of utility, we have sinks uh, along the side. Uh, we have the ability to pull power down right into the middle of the tables. Uh, we have connectivity for computers. Uh, in the space, we have lots of great storage, the ability to move the tables or pull them apart or uh, push them together for different activities. And this uh, example of this STEM lab has, has a, the, a more, um, sometimes we'll call it the damp side, uh, where, where we have the sinks and where you can actually have uh, work that, that's a little messier. And then we have a cleaner side over here, which is more uh, built around a model where you've got collaboration uh, built into the room itself, but it's, but it's not with the amount of utilities. And, and this one actually has access to the outside too. So the idea that you, if you're doing a unit or uh, an item that in, encompasses uh, an outdoor component or you want to include the outdoor component, um, and you can, you can certainly open up the doors and, and go out and um, take advantage of that as well. Uh, we, we've, this is again a closer up of the two examples that we've seen. These, these stairs we're seeing, it, it is the, if you pick up a magazine on new school design, you will see these on just about 90% of all the schools that are going to be built in the next five years. It just seems to be the, the uh, trend in schools. But there's a really good reason uh, for that, and that is because they're inexpensive and highly flexible ways, and they support... Um, 
a multitude of things, but importantly, they, they support a, a socializing in an informal way that students, particularly at the middle school level, really uh, gravitate towards. And so uh, it can be pretty daunting. I, I, I uh, remember when my children, uh, when they came home from middle school, I'd always ask them, you know, if, if I wanted to know what was going on in their social life, I said, who did you sit with today uh, at lunch? And you'd immediately understand who's talking to who, who's not talking to who, and, and what the shifts have been. Uh, and so it, it can be a pretty daunting place to... to um, and so the idea that you break down that hierarchy by having uh, horizontal seating is, is one way in which these uh, really promote community in a way that... Uh, in some ways is f more comfortable for people. Uh, and you, you can be part of the scene, uh, but not necessarily having to worry about your place in the scene uh, as well. The, um, one of the other big things we're seeing is, is uh, an importance, um, when, we, when we saw it in two examples where the, we had window walls that looked out onto courtyards. Here's another example of, of that transparency and natural light um, moving into the interior of a school. Uh, and really thinking about the interior environment and that line between the interior and the exterior. And, and again, this is an example we'd seen as well, but that, that sort of is a, at a much larger scale. And you can see also on the far end of that courtyard, we also have access. <coughs> so it's important as we, as we think about going through a building that we in, invite the outside and natural light into the building at, where we can. So those are some of the, the trends that we're seeing in school design as we start to look at at uh, the uh, organization of what a new middle school might and some of the elements it might have in it. The, the last uh, item we just want to cover, um, and so if there are any questions, I'll answer any questions on that before we move to the, the final piece, which is kind of the milestones and schedules that we have coming up. Questions? Oh, come on, you got to have questions. <laughs> sure. Alderman Lizagolia. Yeah, I just have um, one question, and it's regarding the steps, because when we built this high school, we put in a smaller version of that, mm -hmm. and um, it no longer exists. Yeah. And so I'm wondering yeah. where these exist, yeah. what's happening in terms of usage yeah. by both students and the <coughs> staff? Absolutely. So it's really interesting, that because that, I think... I don't know if you're referring to, there, were, there looked like there were a bunch of these that were built into the corridors, and you can see them as you walk through, and they've, they look like they're display cases now in some instances, or walls in, in other areas. And, and here, um, you can see the scale of them works very differently. You can actually, one of the things we hear constantly is there's no place to get an assembly of a whole team together, either a whole grade or a whole, whole team. And so the importance of having spaces of this size and scale is important because the, inevitably the, the, the three gathering areas that you have at different scales, you have the library, which oftentimes is difficult because there's already functions going in. If you bring an entire couple classes in there, you're disrupting whatever's going on in there. The other place we'll see it is in the cafeteria, which sometimes the acoustics are a little difficult in there, and it also the uh, scale of it feels a little uh, difficult. And, and so this is kind of an offshoot of having something in the cafeteria. The, the last place we see is the gym, which... Uh, oftentimes, again, gym is programmed a lot for PE uh, during the school year or school day, and so the idea of <laughs> of trying to organize people and again the scale of the gym is much larger oftentimes than what you need. The scale of, of something like this is really helpful, be and and also having the fact that it's it's stepped so that you have gr great sight lines um, is really really helpful, and it naturally lends itself. It's sort of uh, uh, like a you know uh, hearkening back to to uh, Greek theater where you, where you actually have uh, this inviting way for students to gather together, which you don't have when you're all on a horizontal plane in some of the other spaces, but it's not as, as uh, expensive or as difficult to maintain as an auditorium. So it's like a mini lecture hall, mini auditorium. And so we find them to be heavily utilized in an informal way during the lunch areas, but then we also see them outside of that being co-opted where you have a presentation screen and you're allowed, you can use it as a, as a mini lecture hall. Thank you. Okay. Yes. To piggyback off of that, so is this kind of in to replace an auditorium in the middle school? Because I think, you know, most of the time we have like the cafetorium or whatever, but is this instead of that idea? So, uh, it, depending on the school itself, so oftentimes um, it's we, what we don't, we don't see a lot of auditoriums going into middle schools. Oftentimes they'll be at the high school. Uh, and so, so this can offer a lot of the functionality of an auditorium without a great deal of the cost for those more informal. But we actually, it, you'll see actually this one has a fair amount of theatrical lighting uh, on the ceiling in this one. And so they actually can use it and, and at a, 
and set it up as, a, as if it were uh, for theatrical plays and things like that. And so, so it can do some of that. You just have to think about that as you're, as you're planning it and designing it. You'll see this one has a lot of acoustic panels on the ceiling uh, as well to help with the acoustics in that, in that space itself. So it, it can function as a, as a mini auditorium, if you will. Other questions? One of the things uh, you said you could do presentations if there was a screen, but mm -hmm. how do you do that during the day with all that light? We actually have uh, motorized shades that just close down ah. on those. So. Okay, and on this one, as I recall, the, the lunch lines are over here, right? That's correct. They and come across the hall and eat over here? That's right. So, so um, and then there was another one, uh, and uh, going back to the West Bridgewater model where um, they... It was really fascinating on, on this one. I don't know if I've got, I guess it doesn't show. Um, so this one right now, the tables that, that are kind of outside of view are over here. But what they did was, so this is, says cafe right here. And this is that hallway uh, right, right here. This is the, you know, looking out onto this courtyard. That two-story glass curtain wall we're looking at is right here. What they did on this side where the kitchen is, they, all they had is a pair of barn doors. And so uh, when they were serving, they'd open up the barn doors and the students would filter into the serving area to get their food. When they're done that, they close the barn doors and it just becomes an open space for students to work at the tables or it's, it's got a common space and so it doesn't have to feel like it's a cafeteria because essentially it's the flexibility of just closing off the whole kitchen and serving area by, by a pair of doors. Uh, made it really flexible for the rest of the time. Um, so. And the material, before anybody asks, is uh, easily cleaned doesn't stain. That looks like carpet. Um, the other one was a different type of material, but yeah, there, there, and in, in, in even when we say carpet nowadays, there are actually some that um, that are resilient products that that have acoustic properties, and sometimes they have fibers. But but there is actually a full gamut of soft surfaces uh, that are maintenance friendly that aren't aren't carpet uh, mm -hmm. per se. But this one has, has a tile floor that's very, very durable and, and easily cleaned. And the nice thing about some of the products that we're seeing in the floors now, um, they don't require a lot of the stripping and waxing uh, that is, is costly. And, um, and also it's actually shown to adversely impact indoor air quality. Uh, and so the idea of, of having easier maintenance and, and healthier environments. Yeah. The other thing I noticed, there was a lot of quizzical faces when we were talking about drifting. The <laughs> snow loads on, on roofs uh, was normally, you know, if I get 10 inches of snow on a roof, but what happens is when the wind blows and the drift ends up being 14 feet deep, that snow is pretty heavy and as soon as it gets, you know, and one of the reasons that uh, we had to put a whole bunch of steel in the uh, school down the south end of Nashville. Uh, so Sunset, Sunset, Sunset Heights, yes. Sunset Heights. Yep. And reinforce that. Yeah, thank you. That Absolutely. Great. So the, the last uh, slide, I think, in our, in our packet for uh, this evening identifies kind of the, the um, uh, steps. So we, we just met, uh, I guess it was two days ago, it feels like it was yesterday, doesn't it? <laughs> and we had, we had great meetings. We, we uh, met again. It's actually kind of the second time we, we've uh, engaged with the, the principals and the administration of each of the schools. The first time was when we were uh, touring all of the schools to get a sense of, of the different uh, features that each of them had. This one, we, we uh, took a deeper dive into specifically all the spaces. So we identified every room in each of the middle schools, what it's being used for, and, and where the acute needs uh, are from, a, from what we call the educational programming perspective. And so that, that um, and, and, uh, and, we, and we found that to be extremely helpful. That also allows us to, to benchmark that in one of the items that, that Jamie talked about, which is what we call that space allocation workbook. And so the idea that uh, we, we know how large each space is, we know how it compares with the Department of Education guidelines for these types of spaces as well. Uh, and it also allows us to project forward in, in thinking about different models of different enrollment fig, uh, figures for, for each of the different schools. And so if we were to look at uh, if we're going to equalize the populations at each of the schools, what does it mean in terms of the spaces that we're going to need? Not simply the classroom spaces, because in some ways those are the easier ones to solve, but it's all of these other support spaces that we really need to make sure that, that we're providing. Um, most of those 
support type spaces and special service spaces were never originally envisioned when most of the schools were constructed. And so they find every corner and, and closet and, uh, uh, and repurposed rooms uh, to, uh, to find them in. And so that, uh, that's part of the evaluation that we're doing right now and looking at are they in the right location and, and are the spaces suitable for the function that's inside of them? Any, any uh, other, uh, I guess, follow up on that, Donna? Or that? I think it was helpful in that a couple of things became clear, and that was that open meeting space, but also um, office space. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. We talked about the, the uh, in, in office space in a, in a uh, whole, do, whole bunch of ways, but, but even in the administration suite itself, but there was um, office space to, for meeting. Um, and, uh, and, and the big thing in, in our, uh, again, that, that we thought was a strong takeaway was um, in looking at uh, the uh, types of, of programming, both the core academic spaces, but also the unified arts and how they're currently being offered and, um, and what, what shifts might want to take place as, as we look at alignment with the high school career tech programs as well. In addition, I just wanted to add, um, as far as office space, I'm also talking about speech language, OT, PT. We actually, in one of the schools, have the um, PT person sharing space with the music program. And in another school, the speech language pathologist is working in a converted closet that's still a closet. In interior space without any windows and uh, and the same ventilation we would put in a in a standard office. So. Mr. Mosier, is that you? Beeping no, you? it's not me doing what? Okay. Did you say it wasn't you? No. All right, who's playing with the phone? Um, <laughs> so to go on with the, the what what the process as we go through. As they said, they're going to be coming up with conceptual designs, and when it then it'll go to high reconstruction, and they will put an initial price. Now, I they probably will be covering all the things that they've found at the schools. Um, we may not be able to do things that aren't directly related to balancing the three schools at 800 students. Uh, so there may be a back and forth on the, on the design and the pricing before we actually go to final design. And we want to, because we're going to have to stay within a, uh, a number that's going to fit into the bonding schedule. So, I mean, that's downstream from here, but right. I know that uh, Harvey wants to get going and starting the pricing because it's like four different units to price. So um, that will be the process, and when we get towards the end of that, then we'll be going forth with a uh, bonding number to get the, the bonding approved. Uh, and so we can start the, the next phase, which would be the detailed drawing, uh, and even then uh, that gets priced out as or the pricing gets updated with the detailed drawing as, as things become clearer. Uh, again, there may be some modifications as we go through that. Uh, we went through an inordinate amount of changes in these two high schools. Uh, the only really good thing we had going for us is we built this one first, learned a lot, and applied it all when we did the South. So you didn't have the same change orders coming over, so uh, uh, there's always unknown unknowns, which, which is why we have contingency accounts. Okay. Um, yeah, just to round out the, the last few items on this uh, page right here. So we have tonight's meeting. We have, as, as the next upcoming meetings, we have a uh, meeting with um, the uh, district-wide athletic director. So we're going to be looking at the uh, current use of uh, uh, physical fitness facilities within the schools as well as the fields. Um, we're going to also, as Jamie, I think, mentioned uh, earlier, uh, sit down and go through where uh, the current um, uh, practices with safety and security are, not, not simply just the facilities, but also the practices to understand uh, how the two work together, both the operations as well as how the schools facilitate safety and security. 
Uh, and, and again, we want to remind everyone who's seeing this, uh, it's not in the room, that that's at 6 o'clock, um, the uh, community forum, and we, we want as many people to come. The intent with the community forum is to provide an opportunity to listen to the community and, and what they have to say about this project, provide an overview of what is uh, current with middle school designs. Uh, but we really want this to be a listening session more than us uh, doing a lot of speaking. We have a couple exercises that we have planned that engage the community in listening to the values that they have that are unique in the, to, to Nashua. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that's an opportunity for us to really hone in on, the, um, on where, where the people are thinking about it. And, and give, again, everyone an opportunity to list for, for them to uh, ask questions and and to understand what is happening with this and where are we going. And, and so, uh, so we really are looking forward to that a, uh, a lot. Um, and then, uh, and then as, as we examine in the, the uh, schedule flow chart, we have a lot of things that are going on behind the scenes too as we move from gathering all this information and start to s analyze it and synthesize it now into some concepts, uh, both for the site and for the buildings. And so that's, that's kind of the, the fun part. It's, it's, uh, we're, we're just on the cusp of getting into that, so it's, uh, it's going to start to speed up qu quite a bit here through the, <laughs> through the summer. So. Additional questions? Yes. Yes. This is Raymond. Oh. Oh. Uh, Mr. Mr. Mosier? Yes. You know, I've uh, listened to these concepts, and I uh, agree they all sound very, very well and good. However, there's uh, something that uh, we have not touched on, but I'd just like to put it out uh, for consideration uh, so it's not uh, excluded from any of the, uh, the more detailed drawings. And that is the, the need for uh, storage space, both for the administration area and for the material that be used in or about the, uh, the classrooms or in the, uh, uh, the other areas where uh, it is necessary to move equipment around uh, for different purposes. And uh, that means that you have to have some place where you can uh, stick things so that uh, you can minimize the amount of moving that has to be done or at least to have a secure place where uh, school records can be kept and uh, other uh, equipment and and necessities for the uh, for the school, so it's just uh, something to keep in mind because I recall when uh, uh, I had the uh, you know to the to the everything of the high school uh, many years ago that uh, we did have a uh, a school vault which I don't think we really need at this time, but the vault at, at the school at that at that time was uh, very much like a uh, a prison cell because it had uh, a secure area and it was enclosed with uh, uh, metal bars uh, to uh, only certain people could have access to uh, what was in the uh, vault. So uh, just something to put out uh, so that they keep it in mind that uh, this is something that has to be engineered into an overall design is the necessity for detailed uh, storage space and the convenience of access to those spaces. Yeah, we've, we've had some discussions on storage space and in the two existing uh, middle schools, storage space has been turned into offices. Um, so part of the changes to the two existing middle schools will be to um, get office space that's more conducive to what it should be being used for and free up some of that storage space. Um, the other thing is, as they go through the study, they're being very, very, very thorough in looking at all the schools. And some of the items on that they're finding and that come out in that report will be added to Mr. Smith's uh, deferred maintenance because it may not be able to be done as part of this study. And when we have a much better handle on, on some of the deficiencies in deferred maintenance, um, hopefully uh, he'll have the money he needs to keep these buildings in proper shape. Now, I know they do a great job because I've, uh, over the years, 
that I've been on the board, I have, um, you know, consistently uh, been aware of what they've done and how they've done it. And uh, also I recall uh, being a part of the discussion uh, back when with the uh, uh, geothermal uh, fiasco. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to go back and visit that one. No. <laughs> Mr. Moser, this is Jamie Willett with Harriman. Uh, I appreciate you bringing up the uh, storage uh, item because that, that was something that we spent some time on Tuesday with the principals asking specifically about A, a the needs um, that they don't have and B, the items that do need to be stored. So we, we asked each one of the principals about each item and, and where they needed it and, and what was there and not there. Um, so that, that's helpful. Thank you. Well, and, yes, I, I'm acutely aware of the, the need for these things, because, uh, like I said before, uh, when I was in the, uh, the high school in, in Brooklyn back in uh, 1949, 1950, that uh, we did have a, uh, a situation there, and uh, fortunately I was able to uh, do uh, some suggestions that, that helped a lot, and I think that... Uh, uh, Different between then and now is is different, but it's the same. So yeah, I know you guys do a great job in designing. So, are there any? Oh uh, yes, Mrs. Raymond. Um, thank you. I have a couple of questions, and they're not related to each other. So um, the first question I have was when you were talking about earlier meeting with the principals, uh, you mentioned some of the CTE alignment with the middle schools. Um, are you meeting with the CTE directors to discuss that further, or did I miss that part? Yeah, I, I think actually, and we may have mentioned it in a previous meeting, but okay. yeah, we, we've actually had a, a meeting with the career tech director uh, for the high schools, and so... Uh, and uh, and and began that conversation. So absolutely. And I don't know if you've got anything else to add, but that, that we didn't meet with them. So. Okay, I apologize. I was yeah. ill the last time, no, and I must have missed it in the minutes. Um, the other question I had was regarding the community forum at Elm Street. Is that open to um, community members interested in all three schools, or is it just to talk about the Elm Street renovation versus new building? Um, my understanding, based on our conversations, is really the meeting is to generate from the community their vision of middle schools in Nashua that will be specific to our city. So it's about generating a vision for what we want for our middle schools. So it would be any community member that's interested, parents, uh, staff, anyone that wants to have a say in what their vision of the middle schools is. Okay. So. That's 100 percent right. That we we want to open it up to to anyone who wants to <coughs> participate in that. But it's really about crafting a, a vision for and a, and a mission statement for the middle schools. So going back to the 50,000 foot level, um, when we address the changes to the three middle schools. We want to bring them up to date with middle school design development. They found that when we had junior high schools that the students got lost going from elementary to the high school. And when they threw that junior school, junior high school model, it was too much for them and they couldn't adjust. And that's why we had a lot of problems. So the new middle school concept is more of a transition from elementary gradual to, to the high school level uh, when things change. Uh, so that's uh, uh, one of the principles that we'll, we'll, be, we'll be looking at. The other thing is that uh, the design cannot incorporate something that's a current whim that's going to change and affect the entire school five years from now. We don't want to be redesigning these buildings. Uh, so when we're designing the building, it's, it's, it's uh, not for any particular ongoing educational, I don't want to use the word whim, but uh, uh, it's going to be, be more generic and, and, and uh, focus on middle school principles that are being used across the country. Alderman Jetty? I almost hate to... Uh to bring this up, but uh, and I, I'm uh, I'm just going to tell you about something I read recently. 
I'm not advocating this, I'm just bringing it up. Uh, I read in the Boston Globe this week that the Boston school system is eliminating middle schools and they're going to a, either a one to six and a seven to 12 model or a one to eight and nine to 12 model, which kind of reminds me of what we used to have. <laughs> and uh, I, just, I just bring that up just I don't know if this is if if they know something we don't know or if they're just outliers or I, I just want to be reassured that we're going down the right <coughs> path here. Yeah, sir, the, and and I guess uh, what uh, what we're seeing is that that is that is not yet uh, a trend that we're seeing either, uh, regionally or or nationally that there is a rapid uh, the, the, or there's such a, an incredible developmental uh, difference to the middle school years. Uh, and that is is largely what drove the whole idea of, and as as uh, Mr. Dow was just saying, that uh, that the the their unique years and offering safe spaces for that particular age group to uh, to go through that developmental change is an important part of it. And so, um, so while we uh, have seen some of the, and now we're actually seeing the range from not just K but pre K to six as, as a common model, but, but the developmental difference between a, a sixth grader and a fourth grader is so, so radically different that, that putting them in a cohort of other students at the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade is still a very commonly accepted practice supporting a positive social development and emotional development at that stage of their lives. In the national thinking that I've read over the years, last few years, is you don't want to have 11-year-olds in with 18-year-olds. And you put them all in one building, you got problems. So we hey, want to keep them separated. Often, oftentimes, even if they are put in the same school, what we'll find is that there are strict separations and separate entrances. Uh, so it's really like having two schools within a school. Uh, to say nothing of the fact that you'd probably have to build large schools to be able to handle that many kids. And now you're into the, the large schools that we're trying to eliminate. So. To me, it doesn't make sense. Yes. Well, either large schools or more schools, <clears throat> smaller, more smaller schools. Yeah. So, problem is, I don't think we have the budget to uh, start making all our schools handle that kind of grade level because um, that would be probably a huge undertaking. And and unless somebody proves that it works, uh, you might be changing it a couple of years later, and then you're stuck with a whole bunch of buildings you don't use. So. Yes. Yeah, just a question uh, from Mark or, or Jamie or Dan. Um, one aspect, I'm sure you guys are going to look at it, but it, it, it just seems paramount to me that it, it's, it's ever-changing. And thinking about where we stand today to the time that we cut the ribbon on, on the project, project or projects, one of the things that's constantly in flux is IT uh, infrastructure and, and be curious to see what the city stance is and where they're going uh, f from wiring to wireless to integrated boards. You know, we have a project now where they wanted to buy the projectors, and we <laughs> said, I think you should wait. It's two or three years out. Projector might not even be available. <laughs> you know, things change that rapidly. So I'm just kind of curious, you know, in the report. I think there needs to be some <laughs> feedback from the city in terms of where do you want to take these schools and what's the focus and, and the goal in terms of infrastructure from an IT standpoint, data and technology. Yeah, I guess from our perspective, what, uh, there's a couple uh, responses to, to that, Carl. One is, is that we build pathways as part of the mm -hmm. building itself. And so that's sort of a way to be able to connect from point A to point B. We don't buy the connections and the technology at the beginning of the project. We buy it at the very, very tail end yeah. um, because it is, it, it's so rapidly changing. And so you, you always wait to get it to that point. And, and we've got an educational technologist on, on our team that will assist in understanding what the latest and greatest uh, uh, ideas are um, relative to that. The, the other thing we, we are seeing, though, um, is that um, 
the costs in general are, are having, um, with, with the rising cost of everything, technology is one of those items that doesn't, has actually come down uh, in cost. And, and if you think of right now, what we used to do is, is outfit every classroom with a, a video projector. Now for about the same cost, we're actually able to put in flat panel monitors in a lot of these that, are, that even have interactive capability on them. So they're much easier to see. Uh, and and they they don't have the issues of lamp replacement that projectors do, and so so and, and we're also seeing that wireless technology is is getting up to the place where it's it's more cost effective and just as fast as putting in hard wiring uh, into a building as well. So there's there's I guess that that's kind of a couple couple items. We we won't really get into a lot of that until we get uh, further along, but we will build in. The connect the, the the pathways to build uh, all that connectivity. Yeah, I, you know, 5G may be along by the time we get done building. The 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 other thing is that uh, when we built these two high schools, um, we decided to build it the last, and we didn't build on the cheap. The old high school fell apart in less than 20 years, and quite frankly, if we had it to do over, we would have torn the building down to its base and built it just like this one. Uh, we learned a lot, but uh, um, if you look around this school, it's 16 years old. It looks almost as good as it did the day it opened. So there's a lot to be said for building it uh, the correct way the first time. Okay, uh, construction manager's report. <laughs> I'm waiting. Not to put you on the spot, but. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing to report. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I like your other project. <laughs> oh. Okay. Uh, invoices. Uh, Mr. Smith. From uh, Harriman in the amount of 14900 Sixteen dollars and thirteen cents. So, do I have a motion to approve the invoice for architect and engineering fees to Harriman A and E in the amount of fourteen thousand nine hundred sixteen dollars and thirteen cents? So moved. Uh, so moved by Alderman Melissa Golia. Any discussion? Seeing none. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Okay. Um, Mr. Smith. So we have actually two contracts to award tonight. Uh, one was in your initial package, and that was for the industrial hygienist. Mm -hmm. There's a spreadsheet that is labeled bid comparison uh, industrial hygienist dated 15 May. And we, have, uh, we had six bidders, and RFP went out in the street. We had six uh, responses, uh, all good companies. Um, and we broke out, I broke out all the costs that they respond to in the RFP. And at the very bottom, I, I took a, a shot at uh, what it, I thought the actual cost would be. In some case, you have to assume how many tests they're actually going to take. And um, so with that, uh, Damaris Environmental of Barrington, New Hampshire was the low bid. Uh, they were at $18,000. I went back to them to verify a few numbers, actually raised their price a little bit to get to 18,000 uh, to make sure they had the entire scope. And so that's my recommendation is to award industrial hygienist to uh, Damaris Environmental. Uh, before we act on that, so what this company does is come in and looks for or identifies hazardous material in your schools, whether it be asbestos or lead paint or PCBs or that, that sort of thing. Um, that helps us to build a budget for what it would cost. We'll work with Carl and Harvey to c come up with costs to actually abate that. Um, then the same uh, company then develops the work plans that are turned over to the uh, actual abating contractor. And then finally, they make sure all the reports are, and all the paperwork is done tightly at the, the very end so that we have uh, good documentation going forward and it gets reported to the state. So all that for the sum of $18,000. Just so you're aware, the, uh, when we did the National High South renovation, a huge expense was mitigating the hazardous materials. So knowing what's 
there to know what the cost would be to mitigate is very important. And this is a very minor cost compared to what it takes to get rid of it. Alderman Lizzie Golia. Yes. Um, I guess I'm looking at these numbers, and, and obviously they're the, the low bidder. Um, and, and I'm looking at some of the other numbers that are coming from New Hampshire um, that are, in one case, um, $700 higher, um, in another, a little over $300 higher. And, and Mr. Smith, I just want to make sure you're, you're comfortable with this amount after going through their bid with them. I am. As, as I said, uh, I went back to them because I was unsure about some things. I wanted to make sure, for example, that when they gave us um, the cost for a, um, I'll pick out an example, a basement work plan, that mm -hmm. that was for all three schools or each individual school. They actually bid, in their case, individual schools. So I took their number and multiplied it by three. So okay. those are the sort of adjustments I had to make. But yes, I'm comfortable with the numbers they provided. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Do I have a motion to award the hygienist contract the amount of $18,000 to Damaris Environmental of Barrington, New Hampshire? So moved. Uh, motion's been made. Do I hear any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Smith. The second thing, you may recall at our last meeting, we, uh, we identified a need for an additional piece of work um, for traffic analysis to understand completely what sort of traffic was going around our three schools, uh, existing three schools, plus what we could anticipate in the proposed school site in the southwest part of the city. Uh, we had an RFP out in the street. Uh, it gave us authority to spend um, $5,000 and uh, nobody bid. A <laughs> single company came in. We reached out to some companies that we knew of, uh, engaged Harriman and, and Harvey and people they knew, nobody bid. So um, reached out again to the, the same group. Uh, I added uh, DPW's engineering office because they deal with traffic, obviously. And even re reached out to uh, Heiner Swanson, who uh, is our surveyor, and very well known in, in Nashua. So word finally got out, and this uh, company called Vanessa Associates uh, gave us a proposal, and uh, it's the, the total amount is twenty-four thousand. I asked Sharon Frothingham to mail it, email it to everybody, so hopefully you did receive it. Um, <laughs> if you had took the, ch the the time to read through it, it, it sh it's obvious that there's a lot of work that goes in place. They have to sit at each school for two hours each day, the morning and the afternoon. That uh, and when the kids and staff come in and then a dismissal. Um, if you go further into it and, for example, look at the one of the maps of uh, Elm Street, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve 12 different points. We have to sit there and, and basically count heads or, or count vehicles going by. Um, it's not quite that bad because what they often do is they get cameras that they put on those sites and then they go back and watch the film afterwards. Um, so as, as it turned out, uh, the, the 5,000 that we talked about last month would have barely covered one school uh, in this sort of scenario. And having gone through this, uh, I visited, or he visited with me um, last week and then finally gave us a proposal. It's a good firm, they're, they, they're an offshoot of VHB, who's done a lot of work for the city in, in traffic analysis. Um, I'm comfortable with the proposal. So it's uh, from Vanessa and Associates, um, and they're out of Andover, Mass., and, and the total is 24000 So when uh, we first had problems with this, normally we try to keep within New Hampshire, for, or even better yet, Nashville, if we can, for companies, but nobody was bidding. Uh, I reached out to uh, Sean and told him to expand the border over the border. Um, we also checked with BPW, their people that would normally do a traffic study and they really didn't have the people to do this scope, but they're also on another traffic study and they're all their people are really busy. We have to get this done by the end of school, which is June 15th, so we're on sort of a deadline. All right.
right. Any other questions about the bid? Mr. Greenham. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to know if um, they're going to give us recommendations for all those turning movement counts that they're doing, all those locations. So those are off-site. There's some that are um, at the access. And so, so when they when they count the cars, they're going to do analysis and they're going to give us recommendations for improvements at those at those locations. Is that is that how this study is going to work? Um, I, I would just point you towards their scope of work that they're doing. So doing an awful lot of data collection, uh, provide, you know, counting heads basically. Um, they're going to review how, how things work at each, each one of those intersections, um, measure lengths of queues. You know, a lot of our schools we have a couple of things. Many, many th things. A couple of things. They're going to provide the data that they collect on the traffic movements counts right. to Harriman and to Harvey uh, probably. And so that they can make decisions going forward relative to the de design and, and traffic flow and new driveways and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so they have to know the traffic movement. The other thing we found out as we were looking into this, there's been at least three students hit on Elm Street at Elm Street mm -hmm. uh, that we know of. And one at Fairgrounds. And one at Fairgrounds. Right. So making sure the traffic flows the correct way is pretty important. But at this point, we, we, we need, to, this is a very good firm. They do good work. We've got to get them going. Uh, I, I guess my question is like, when, when they do the, they're going to do the data collection, we're going to have the data, but then are they, they, they're going to come to some conclusions uh, about those locations, like uh, um, make recommendations. You should do this so that traffic flows. Is that, is that how it how if I can help? finish my answer yeah, from before. <laughs> uh, yeah, so if, if, again, if you look at their proposal, uh, I'll just read straight from it. You're going to get recommendations with respect to overall site access and on-site circulation and pedestrian safety. Uh, recommendations will include site access, recommended signage plans, pedestrian improvements, bicycle provisions, and the school drop-off and pickup traffic management plan. So it's going to be pretty thorough. It's going to cover everything uh, along with the recommendations for each of the schools. Okay, great. Thank you. I, I should have read more thoroughly. I'm sorry. I, I did read it, and I don't have it with me. I did read it over once. I just, I just want to make sure that we end up with some uh, recommendations on-site and off-site so that we have good traffic circulation, and that day one we don't end up with a giant traffic jam. You know, But I, I think that's. I probably should have read it more closely. But uh, thank you. I didn't mean to suggest you didn't. No, no, I, that's all right. I was no, looking I, myself I for the actual recommendations. Yeah, because usually so. th there's a site impact and access plan, and it should have, you know, on-site and off-site recommendations. So I just wanted to make sure that they, they were going to be in there uh, to, to have those improvements. And, and they say, okay, you're going to need a four-way stop here or a roundabout there. You know, just conceptual. There's no big design or anything, but just to uh, tell us about how our traffic's going to flow, and I wanted to make sure that they they included pedestrian, um, which which they which they are going to do pedestrian flows too. This will directly feed the Harriman's uh, site engineer themselves, and they when they do the design right. for the schools, they'll incorporate the recommendations. Right, Be because it's not it's not just on site. You want to you want to know what's going on off site too, and around the schools, and how how they're going to come together so that, that you don't have those giant queues that people dropping their kids off in the morning. That's, that's what I'm concerned about, so. Mrs. Raymond. Thank you. So I tend to agree that $24,000 is worth it if we can not have kids get hit by cars ever again. Um, but I'm curious about budget. Um, so we initially said 5,000. This is like five times that. Do, do we have the space to do that? Yeah, so if you, if you happen to have the financial sheet in front of you, uh, I've not updated it for this contract, okay. but I'd set aside 20000 for a traffic study. Uh, we had uh, 14500 kind of a contingency pot. Okay, great. So just take four from one and stick in the other. Great. Uh, in addition, uh, the hygienist was 2000 below what I budgeted here, so there, there's enough money. All right. Remind me again of the name, and I'm happy to make the motion. <laughs> it's... Uh... Vanessa and Associates. Yeah. Vanessa? Vanessa. 
Vanessa, okay. So then I, I would move that we award the traffic study contract to Vanessa and Associates for $24,000. Thank you. Any other discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Anything else, Mr. Smith? Uh, that's it for this evening. Okay. Is, are there any questions at all for Harriman or Harvey at this point? Nope. Okay, comments by members of the public? <laughs> comments by committee members? Nope. Okay, we don't need a non-public. Do I hear a motion? Vote to adjourn. Motion is to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We're adjourned at 8.26 p.m.